It's always been really important to me to be a good person, whatever that means. And I know I'm not alone in that, right? Um, growing up, this was a very rigid definition I had for myself that involved following all the rules, obeying my elders, and generally striving for perfection in my entire way of being, which I took extremely seriously and uh, you know, made a very fun quality uh, to be around me. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, after many years of putting a lot of pressure on myself, I gradually came to this conclusion uh, that this was a futile endeavor, perfection. And I decided to come up with a new standard for myself, which is to care and to try. You know, to be a good friend, I should care about that friend and also try my best to show up for them to the best of my ability or capacity at that time. You know, that's just common sense. You know, you, when you love something, you take care of it. And, you know, maybe it would be if I just had one friend and that was all I cared about. But it's not that easy, is it? It's 2023, y'all. We have a lot to care about, arguably too much. I think a lot of us would argue too much. In addition to caring about our own selves, our own well-being, we also have all of our relationships. We have our work and career. We have all of the communities that we're a part of. And, you know, also the rest of the freaking planet. All of the other people that live here and the other species and the planet itself. Um, and I think that most of us, if not all of us, care about a wide variety of those things, if not all of those things. So the problem isn't caring. We care plenty. We're overwhelmed by how much we care. We have compassion fatigue. The problem is how do we care and manage to do anything about that while also getting groceries and doing the laundry and bathing yourself constantly? and all the other basic but long list of responsibilities that we all have, right? I mean, that's really how we feel. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. Okay, so uh, what do we do? You know, raise your hand or groan or something if you can relate to this. Um, you read an article or maybe you listen or you watch the news and you, know, you learn about a problem that you care about and the problem has not been solved yet, so uh, it's upsetting. You might feel angry. You might feel heartbroken. This has probably happened to you in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I doubt that I'm the only one who has cried after reading the news, right? We're only human. Um, but then, you know, what do you do? Maybe you go vent to someone or you go on social media. But ultimately, you've got to get on with the rest of your day because you've got a to-do list and all of those responsibilities. So move on. Next day, you read another article. Maybe it's about the same problem. Maybe it's about a different problem you care about. And it's upsetting all over again. You're feeling all these emotions. And at this point, it's only Tuesday. And you're emotionally exhausted. And you still haven't done the laundry. So you move on again. Now it's Wednesday. And um, maybe you don't even read the news that day. Or maybe you do, but you just kind of scroll past to the entertainment and the sports. Um, and that doesn't actually feel great right? Because we do care. We just don't know how to care and do anything about it that matters. And we doubt that anything that we could do as an individual can make a difference. So let's flash back to 2006. Um, I was 16 years old and, you know, one of those People that takes things very seriously, especially every speech or quote that ever told me it was my job to be the change. I was very um, idealistic and passionate. And this summer, I was particularly on one because I had just found out I was going to be one of the captains of my cheer squad and on junior class council. And I had a college prep program at Spelman and a leadership conference in D.C. And I was just feeling inspired as hell and motivated and determined to change the world in one way or another. This was also the same summer that my dad took me to see An Inconvenient Truth, which is a documentary about global warming. And so I walk out of that independent movie theater, uh, which, you know, support your local independent movie theaters, and I decide it is my mission in life to save the planet. And what is my strategy? 
Recycling, obviously, of course, recycling. Recycling was so hot in the aughts. <laughs> so I start carrying a reusable water bottle with me everywhere. I start snatching bottles and cans from my family members. I was digging through trash cans at school, trying to make sure everything was properly sorted. Very cool. And I even saved up for a road trip with my friends with all our recycling money. Um, I had a friend recently who just told me in this past year that she still thinks of me every time she recycles, which I weirdly have to hope is every day. <laughs> so flash forward to 2018, uh, which, sorry to bring us back there so soon. Uh, this is deep in an era where many of us are reading about the you know, new horrors on the news on a daily basis. And uh, it was a particularly rough year for the planet or maybe the first of many, or one of the first of many, it felt horrible. Um, there were historic, record-breaking everything, wildfires, drought, hurricanes, etc., which was scary. It was all starting to get very real. Um, this was also the, the, first, the year that the first report came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that said, you know, laid out all of uh, the scary stuff that was gonna continue to happen with climate change if we didn't get our act together, which was sobering. Um, this was also the same year that I learned the heartbreaking news that recycling was not the end-all be-all climate solution that I thought it was, that um, our recycling situation in the United States is a hot mess, and that only 9% of all plastic that had ever been produced has been recycled. So my idealism was certainly being tested, but not defeated. And that is because um, something else happened that year, and I had also recently learned about two new concepts that were my new source um, of inspiration and strategy for change, which were social entrepreneurship and conscious consumerism. So in 2014, I shocked the hell out of everyone in my life by deciding to go to grad school and get a master's of business administration, of all things, with a certificate in social innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, this was a shock because, for one thing, I was a screenwriting major in undergrad. And for another thing, uh, I was notorious for seeing business as being the enemy. Uh, that I was highly aware of all of the harm that had been done by big corporations. Um, but it was also around this point that I started realizing that if business has the power to do all this harm, it also has that same amount of power to do good. You know, businesses have so many levers at their disposal, from the way they treat their employees to the way they source their ingredients and materials and packaging, uh, from the way they show up in the communities that they're a part of. And then I had another aha moment, which is that the businesses with all this power are ultimately at the mercy of whom? <laughs> their end users, consumers, us. People who have to occasionally or frequently purchase goods and services in order to operate in this modern world. Now that is power. And I was high on it, okay? <laughs> um, so that is conscious consumerism, which is the idea that you can use that purchasing power as an individual to have a positive social, environmental, and or economic impact. Um, you know, every time that we spend our money with a business, what we're communicating to that business is, keep doing what you're doing. We like it so much, we are going to pay you our hard-earned money for, money for it. You know, businesses can't stay in business unless somebody gives them money. So therein lies an opportunity. And the beauty of this is that it's just doing the same stuff you're already doing every day with just a little more intention. So the high point of 2018 is that I decided to start a social enterprise with one of my good friends, Lindsay, who is also very committed to conscious consumerism. Uh, we started a social enterprise called Way of Being, which is a shop that offers low-waste, sustainable, ethically sourced alternatives to the things we use every day, like personal care products, you know, from shampoo to toothpaste, as well as cleaning supplies like dish soap and laundry detergent. So the idea being to empower people to use their everyday actions a little more intentionally and have a huge impact. Now, okay, maybe you might be a little skeptical that 
anything that you can actually do as an individual actually does make a difference and is worth your precious energy. Now that's the Wednesday part of you talking, the part that's burnt out on bad news and just, you know, has a to-do list and you're just worried about me adding to it, right? So let me assuage some of those fears with um, a few examples. So the first example is physical. Um, every time we buy a physical product, there is a full life cycle in addition to the amount of time that we're actually using it. So let's take um, something that we are all very familiar with, uh, a single-use plastic utensil, a fork. Um, so the beginning of a fork's life starts uh, deep under the earth uh, as a petroleum-based fossil fuel that then has to be extracted, literally releasing carbon into the atmosphere when it would be much happier stored under the earth. Second uh, stage of this life cycle is production. Now, plastic production is incredibly energy intensive and makes up 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Then we make it to the third phase of this fork's life cycle, which is distribution. It's got to get from where it was produced to the corner store or office supply store, or wherever we're getting that fork from, right? Uh, shipping across the, across the world and contributes 2% to global greenhouse gas emissions. And then this fork reaches its peak mission in life, which is for us to use it for 20 to 30 minutes to eat baked beans at a barbecue or salad at our desk for lunch or Thanksgiving dinner. And then what? We throw it away. Most curbside recycling facilities in the United States do not accept plastic forks like this for a variety of reasons. So most of them, if they're lucky, end up in a landfill. Um, so if, say, you're the average American, which I'm not saying you are, but say you are, um, you get takeout once a week. And so if you get takeout once a week, that is 52 forks a year. If you live to age 77, like the average American does, that adds up to 3,120 forks over the course of your adult life. Um, you know, that's sad. <laughs> that's all sitting in a landfill somewhere. We can all agree with that. And, you know, that's not even the spoons and the knives or, you know, the hot sauce packets or whatever that are coming with that takeout. Um, oh, but okay. Say you're 33 like I am and you decide today uh, you are going to cut out one plastic fork out of your life for, you know, the rest of your life. That would be a reduction of 2,288 plastic forks from the landfill. You thought you were just a speck in the universe, you're not. You have a physical impact, and the choices that you make can add up. Now, this is just forks. Okay, say we add the rest of the utensils, and plastic bottles, and plastic bags, paper plates, and napkins, and food waste, and conference swag, right? That can add up to quite a lot, or a lot less, depending on how intentional we are about that. So the second example is... Um, the influence of our dollars on the market. So uh, let's take an example like organic food. Um, you know, just 15 to 20 years ago, it was a lot harder to find organic food, right? If you went to a conventional supermarket, there might have been a couple handfuls of options, and it was way more expensive than the conventional um, um, alternatives. And uh, just, you know, in the past couple of decades, that has changed quite a bit. And that is due to social entrepreneurship and conscious consumerism. Uh, as an example of a social entrepreneur, there was John Mackey, who is one of the founders of Whole Foods. When he started Whole Foods in 1978, it was a niche counterculture concept to uh, be offering locally sourced organic produce. You know, this was the era of canned food. Uh, flash forward to now, organic food makes up 6% of the entire food market in the United States with a growth of 8% year over year. And just from 2011 to 2021, the number of organic farms in the United States doubled. That is all due to social entrepreneurs, grocers, farmers making those options available to us and conscious consumers who went out of their way to buy it. And this market is still growing. That is power. That is power that has an effect on our bodies, on the farmers who farm that land, and on the communities, and on the environment. The third example is about how our actions influence others and can help drive social change. You know, humans are hardwired to try to be a part of a group. 
and we are very heavily influenced by our peers, by social pressure. You know, our ancient ancestors knew that it was safer to be a part of a group because you had somebody literally watching your back to make sure you didn't get eaten by a predator. And you could also watch your friend try out a new berry to uh, make sure it wasn't poisonous. <laughs> you don't have to do all that trial and error yourself. So still, we take what our peers say very seriously. We like being part of a group. We try to do things to be accepted by them. Um, and we you know, take their decisions really seriously, and we're very influenced by that too. You know? Why do we go to Yelp to read reviews for restaurants? We want to know what, our, what people think. Why do we ask our friends what vacuum cleaner they use? We want to know what they think. We, we don't want to have to do all that tri trial and error ourselves. So that is called social proof. And this is arguably our most powerful superpower as humans, the ability to influence each other. And the crazy thing is that it actually only takes a minority of people to create major social change. There was a 2018 study done by University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School of Communication that found that the tipping point for social change is 25%. That means that only 25% of a group has to adopt a new social norm in order for it to then become rapidly accepted by the rest of the group. That means that just you and a small minority of people can make climate action cool. And you can spread it like wildfire. That's actually within your power. I mean, just even think about your own family or your own friend group. If you start doing things a little differently and you get one other person or two or three other people, you individually make a difference in that way. So where does that leave us? What can we actually do that makes a difference? So according to Project Drawdown, there are seven categories of actions that individuals can take, that individuals and households can take that can contribute 25 to 30 percent of the total emissions reductions needed to avoid dangerous climate change. Let me say that again. A quarter of the total emissions reductions needed to avoid disastrous, scary climate change can be done by individuals and households. Okay, so that means that not only does what we do matter, it's too good of an opportunity to pass up. These are the seven categories. Reducing food waste, eating more plants and less meat and animal products, making your home more energy efficient, using public transit, carpooling, riding a bike or driving an electric or hybrid car instead of a gas-powered vehicle, recycling or composting as much of your waste as possible, reducing your plastic and virgin paper consumption, and opting for virtual meetings and work. Now, if you're looking at this list and you're starting to get overwhelmed because your to-do list is already long, okay, don't freak out because you don't have to do everything at once. Not everybody has to do everything and not everybody can do everything, but everyone can do something. Okay, take, you know, take your own lifestyle, your own general way of being as a starting point and go from there. For me, for example, I don't own a home, so I can't add solar panels or uh, you know, smart thermostat or whatever to my apartment. But I do do most of the grocery shopping for my household, so I can prioritize reducing plastic packaging from groceries and personal care and cleaning supplies. Um, say you have young children, and the idea of cutting out string cheese and fruit cups and you know, potato chip bags is daunting to you. But maybe you can drive your kids to school in a hybrid vehicle, or maybe you can teach them about recycling and composting. And maybe you have a very tight budget. And if you do, the amazing thing is that the most impactful things on this list actually save you money, like reducing food waste. Maybe you learn how to store your produce uh, more efficiently so that it doesn't go bad in the back of your fridge. Or you eat all of your leftovers, or you avoid overshopping for groceries, or even at restaurants. And certainly eating a more plant-based diet and less meat can also save money too. There are endless opportunities every day for us to make a difference. And we know now that it does in fact matter. You don't have to be perfect, but you can care and you can try. Find ways to be intentional with your everyday way of being 
and use your power for good. You can be one of the individuals who help save the world. Thank you.